Right. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming all the way out here for this to next topic of the talk we're going to have. We're going to talk about Reform 3.0, China's Next Direction. Um, I'm going to make a very quick introduction. We'll start with Bob Hormatz, who is the Undersecretary for Economic Development, Energy, and the Environment for the State Department. Evan Fe Feigenbaum, Feigenbaum, who is the uh, Vice Chairman of the Paulson Institute. Evan was previously um, had a long experience in um, business consultancy and in the State Department in Asia. And on my left here, we have uh, Perry Wong, who's the Director of Research at the Milken Institute. And um, Jim McGregor is uh, pinch hitting for us because Nina uh, Hashigan um, um, was unfortunately unable to make it today. But Jim has terrific experience in China. Jim is currently the uh, senior consultant at APCO. Um, he's written quite a few books on China business, and he was formerly the CEO at Dow Jones China. So the topic today is uh, China 3.0, and um, we've seen 30 years of huge economic growth in China. And that has happened as a result of several inflection points. 1979, 1980, the leadership took a big uh, move forward in terms of opening up the economy. In 1990s, we saw China really start to enter the global um, economic system. And these two things have kind of powered the growth for the last 30 years. But um, it looks like we're entering a new inflection point now, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about here because the China growth model, export-led economies, um, appears to be slowing down or flagging. So um, I guess one of the things we're going to be talking about here is what happens next. So I'm going to start with asking the question here. Everybody thinks that, at least a lot of Americans think that China's going to eat our crust, you know, economically. They're growing so fast. They're going to be the world's largest economy very soon. And yet, at the same time, in a, ever since the change in leadership, we've heard a lot of talk about reform. What needs to be fixed if they're doing so well? Evan? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think you're right. I mean, if you, up until very recently, if you picked up a newspaper and you read about China, it was this narrative of a relentlessly successful country that had just gone from strength to strength to strength. And while that partially captures what's happened over the last few decades, uh, there are two problems with it. One is it only captures part of the story, and second is that China's own leaders, I think, don't really believe it anymore. So you have a growth model that really has depended much too heavily on two pillars, one of which is investment, particularly by the government, in fixed assets, uh, things like infrastructure, uh, and second on export-led uh, sectors. Um, and the first pillar has frayed because it's introduced all kinds of distortions and imbalances uh, into the Chinese economy. Uh, and the second pillar has frayed because I think the last few years in particular have showed how vulnerable China's export-led sectors are to dips in demand in the rest of the world. So you have a model that's really running out of gas in some ways and imperative to change it. Uh, you have, you asked, you know, what do they need to change? Um, they have to move from a model that's so heavily focused on production to one in which consumption is not, you know, under 40% of GDP, uh, but larger. Household consumption needs to grow faster. Uh, they need to address things like income inequality, where those who reap the fruits of reform are not just big corporates and the government, but also ordinary Chinese, private business, households. They need to deal with this problem of a developed and a developing country in the same country. You fly from Shanghai to Gansu, you go across a century. So you have a developed and developing country paradox. And last, a growth model that really is energy intensive, but energy inefficient. And the ways to do that that they have focused on uh, include things like using urbanization to get a consumption windfall, uh, promoting virtuous investment cycles through wage hikes, uh, and really trying to hopefully uh, use financial levers uh, to uh, uh, move capital accumulation out of the corporate sector and much more into the household sector. And those are really tough reforms to do. So uh, the test is there, and the good news, I think, is that on paper they get it, uh, but it's not an intellectual challenge. It's a political one. There are plenty of good reform economists in China who understand the problems. So if you think of them as doctors, they've diagnosed the problem correctly. And they've prescribed a lot of the right solutions in their five-year plan and in other documents. But uh, there are a lot of reasons why people are pessimistic, not least that the politics are very difficult because of powerful vested interests that will resist change, uh, but also because it's a big execution challenge of unprecedented 
size and scope. So we'll give them a few years and see what happens. But I think that's one reason everybody's so gloomy about China. Hmm. Gloomy about China. And that's a new phrase I hadn't heard for a while. Bob, what do you think? Well, I, th I think Evan's uh, put his finger on most of the key issues. Let me just go through a few of the key points that, um, that I think are particularly important now. And Jim, who's my tutor and mentor in all this, and I talk about this a lot, so I think perhaps our views will be similar in many respects. One is that I think people have been very preoccupied with the growth rate of China. The leaders in China today do not have this notion of a race for growth. They see the bigger challenges are the kind of growth, the quality of growth, the equity of growth. How do they deal with all the implications of that growth? So you know, people say, will they be the biggest economy bigger than the United States five or 10 years from now? Probably yes. But that is really not what we ought to be looking for. We ought to be looking underneath that. What are the, the inequities that are building up as a result of very substantial beneficiaries of growth in eastern China and parts of central and western China that are not enormous beneficiaries of this, that feel that they're lagging and then want to come to the big cities in order to get jobs? They come into the big cities, but due to what they call the hukou system, they don't have city rights. That presents big problems with them that they don't really feel a part of this. So when you hear them talk about urbanization and you hear Li Keqiang talk about it, and when I was there just a couple weeks ago at the Boao Forum, they made a big point of saying, we are going to have some greater degree of urbanization, but we also have to pay much more attention to the rural sector because they don't want this massive number of people coming to cities and they don't want disaffection in the rural sector. So that's another quality equity element in the, in the overall growth picture. The third is the, 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 the endemic problem of pollution. Um, and it is everywhere. And when I met with the NDRC, which is sort of the large planning group that reports the state council, um, I asked them, what was your biggest single challenge today? Pollution. Pollution is a huge problem. Now you would say, well, in this country where they're looking to have higher growth, you go to these big cities, pollution's not just a quality of life issue because you can't breathe very well in Beijing, and not just Beijing, many cities, Wuhan, many other cities you go to, um, Hefei, same thing. But it's a health problem. It is a health problem, particularly since many of them only have one child. Children are particularly susceptible to poor water, um, poor air, and uh, so, they, so they have to deal with that. Then they have a huge energy issue, and the energy issue is both an energy issue and an environmental issue. Uh, because while they do have, and they're starting to do fracking, fracking in various uh, provinces, Sichuan province, they've got a lot of coal, various other provinces, they've got a lot of coal. But their, their geological formations are very different from ours. So the technology that we use may or may not be applicable to various parts of China. So they need to have an environment to attract foreign companies to come in to do this. You have to have joint ventures if you're drilling on mainland China. Companies are worried about intellectual property protection if they participate in, joint, in those joint ventures. But they also have the problem of water. And, they have a, and so the notion that they can engage in this sort of fracking horizontal drilling revolution is a very nice one, but they have a lot of environmental issues. They have a lot of water issues. We're actually working with them on this, but it's, it's not going to be a, a sort of quick miracle for them, although it will, to the extent they substitute natural gas for coal, help to deal with their CO2 issue uh, to a degree, but it's, it's not a final answer. They're moving more dramatically toward uh, renewables and a, and a variety of other things. Two other quick points. One, the issue of vested interests, um, I think, is something that really is challenging because in many parts of China, the government has tried to cool down bank lending uh, in various provinces because there's a bubble, and the housing bubble in many provinces. But in many cases, provincial leaders and the banks have an interest in getting money for some of these projects because they do create jobs temporarily. So a lot of vested interests in various provinces and in state enterprises want to do things and want to get subsidies that are not necessarily good for the country because they lose a lot of money, but they're good for that province or they're good uh, in terms of the leader in that province or that city being able to create jobs, which in turn helps him or her to 
advance politically. So the vested interests in the state enterprises and in various provinces tend to impede uh, dramatic change of, of any sort. So, they, so these are just some introductory uh, thoughts about, about the system. On the other hand, I don't think we should be too pessimistic because they're putting a lot of money into research. They're doing, as usual, their contradictions in China. They're burning the most CO2. They're emitting the most CO2 of any country, but they're also putting more money into renewables than any country. It's a big country, so they, they can do both, uh, but they need to do a lot more of the latter than the former, but they're beginning to move in that direction. They, they understand, there's nothing we can tell them that they don't really understand. Evans put his finger on it, and, and, and Jim has written a lot about it. The question is, can they overcome these vested interests that enable them to make the kind of reforms? There are examples of people who've done this. And you know, this is, you say, 3.0. 3 if you go through the history of China, just very briefly, you've got Mao Zedong. I mean, he created the, the, the beginning of the modern China. But 50 million people died of starvation. So he did almost nothing on the economic side. When I got started, I was working for Kissinger. We had no trade with China. China had very little trade with the rest of the world. Now China is, is booming. Why is it booming? It's in part booming because of China, uh, the next round in China, China 2.0, Deng Xiaoping, who really opened up China, changed it. Then there was really China 3.0. I would say this is China 4.0. 3.0 was Zhu Rongji. He got them into the WTO, which gave them new trade opportunities. But very importantly, he used the opening of China to make dramatic changes internally in China. He, the, re, the, the way he, as, as Deng did, he realized that he couldn't change China internally without exposing it to more competition and forcing from outside in kind of the changes that are needed. The question for uh, Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, the, the premier, is whether now in this new environment with all these challenges that they have, the energy challenge, the pollution challenge, the fact that global markets are not doing as well as they would like to keep up exports. Can they use some of the challenges they face in the environmental area and in the external environment to force dramatic changes internally in China? Um, and can they get political support and can they overcome the resistance that they're going to get? These are the kinds of challenges China faces. Well, thanks, Bob. That's a real big laundry list there. It's interesting that you mentioned the environmental issue. Um, after all my years in Beijing, I actually failed my physical test when it came to the breathing. The doctor asked me if I was a smoker, which I'm not, by the way. <laughs> but um, being it, there makes you a smoker. I uh, know you're. I'm like you know, ten pack a day when I'm living there, even though I don't smoke at all. But here's the issue. I mean, both you and Evan seem, you know, perhaps on the optimistic side that um, change in a positive way could happen, that reform could happen. Am I right there? And I'm sort of wondering. If. To the side of the panel, if, if you guys are perhaps <clears throat> slightly more pessimistic, because you know we've seen so much in the media recently, stories about corruption of princelings, mm -hmm. the environment doesn't seem to be getting any better. It certainly, no. it seems to have worsened, actually. Not noticed. So um, is this note of optimism warranted, or do you want to you know, My kick your wagon over? My is if. <laughs> if they if they're willing to take on uh, can I uh, go on keep your wagon over can I have a slide nine please I think I, I would hesitate to call what have happened in China for the past I actually just somewhat disagree with Bob I don't want to count all the way back to 1949 to me a mean, meaningful China perhaps started in 1979 and and so the 3.0 I counted is 79 92 uh, perhaps 2001, if, you, if you, that would be a half. Uh, I will co come back and later explain why that is a half, so it will not be three. Is, uh, China, there's no <coughs> model in China. So when, when people say the Chinese model is running to the end of the road, so they have to find a new way to do things. The way I look at China is, is one experiment after the other. So if you call on the bravery of uh, Deng Xiaoping by opening up China, I, I would say that at the time, that economically, politically, China was bankrupt at that time. Uh, very little money saved in the state vault, and politically, people just lost the leadership. Uh, they have no idea where China would be going. And socially at that time, it was very quiet, very peaceful, by the way, so no protest whatsoever. Uh, but nonetheless, have no life in society. So that was the backdrop of 79. So if you follow that point on, 
then Chinese government, if you look at it, politically, China has done very little. So some experiments, such as the party demo uh, democratization, are party procedures. So they, instead of one man say so, you have seven or nine people say so. Uh, that is a big improvement, but that make it uh, administratively very difficult, uh, as we can see. And economically, the Chinese government had tried different practices, if you will, to try to open up the economy. One of the big goal they spent 10 years is to negotiate the joint WTO. They saw it ex as a big opportunity. So they reformed state-owned enterprises. So many of those are many steps along the way uh, to actually get to a big goal. And, and let's go back to the big goal later. And so you can see this one experiment after the other. They all build up to what we see, I wouldn't call it perfect storm, but it is a juncture that each of those experiments go awfully bad. So they are not coordinating well enough to make the economic entity, social, or function in the way that can grow a what the party or leader perceived to be <coughs> a harmonious society. And that's why if you look back in the past five years, every single thing from the Chinese government or the policy is building a harmonious society. So you're saying that some of these experiments went bad? That it's not bad. I think they all achieved their purpose. So they joined WTO, they became the number one exporter mm -hmm. uh, past Germany, and they became the number two economy. So all those go, if you look at it, they are awfully, awfully, <laughs> I think, right on the mark where they want to be. But then the problem is, all those experiments by different ministry, by different vision at one point or the other, that pull factors off from a very focused how you build a nation in a way that people will be proud, if you will, and be very happy. And I think the leader should look back and say, yeah, well, if you look at the GDP growth, and can I have uh, the last slide? I forgot the number. Um, all the GDP number, the, the economists like to measure things and number, and that's one thing that I think same way as engineers. They look at the number and say, ha ha, I know where I need to do. So China has all the good number to look at and the planner go accordingly. But politically, the experiment uh, in political arena is behind. And I would say it's not very successful, judging by the last uh, power handover from one generation to the other, the hiccup there. So socially, people are not happy. Uh, you have city government, the county government, grabbing lands, with no good reason, and even the central government would not agree that the practice should continue. But nonetheless, uh, the villages and counties would continue to grab lands, farmlands, to build house, and corruption occur very badly at that level. So if you look at those, um, those are the challenges uh, that the Chinese government from now on have to look at it holistically. So uh, bottom line is, yes, I'm optimistic. And the problem of those, we all we just talked about, have been known to the Chinese government at, as far back as 2002 or three. So that was then the expectation, a lot of intellectual in China in 2003, uh, 2003 and four, pretty much call on, we need political reform, but that never happened. So now, fast forward now. So we are getting to the point that the divergency is pulling so far apart that things has to be done, or the quote unquote, the model cannot be built or in a way that will be synchronized in a way that ma meaningful progress in society. Well, you, all three of you appear to be painting, and correct me if I'm wrong here, a very interesting scenario of a sort of like a things fall apart, the center cannot hold. And I'm sort of wondering what you think of this, Jim. I mean, you're, you've been particularly, I think, um, pessimistic on that issue, particularly that's a, possibly of huge interest to most of our um, audience here, which is on the issue of business um, and SOE reform particularly. Do you want to add your opinion to? Yeah, I'm uh, both optimistic and pessimistic. I've lived in Beijing 25 years, and if I get up in the morning, we actually can see the sky, I'm optimistic, and then by <laughs> noon, you can't see the building next door, and I get pessimistic, I guess. Um, well, let's, let's, um, let's, let's kind of roll back here what we're talking about because I, I don't disagree with anything that's said. So let's, let me just frame it from the party's point of view. I mean, remember, everything goes to the party in China. In America, our government can be inefficient and sometimes even ridiculous, and I'm speaking of Congress, not the State Department, Bob. 
Um, Thank you. But <laughs> our business can move ahead. I mean, look, American companies have more cash on the balance sheet. Our stock market is doing quite well. Not sure why. Um, but we're, we've come out of it with our government being in disarray and can't even figure out how to fund ourselves, et cetera. Why? Because the government kind of matters in the U.S., but it doesn't control everything. In China, the government has less room for error because it's got its hands on everything. You know, the Communist Party got a grip on everything going in 1950 when they built the whole state-planned economy. And you've got to remember that, that planning, those state banks, the state-owned enterprise, is still really the core of what goes on. You have to look at the Communist Party as kind of like General Electric run by a secret <coughs> society. Because it's like General Electric, and it's a very impressive organization. It's got, it, it gets very good people. It moves them to jobs of ever-increasing responsibility. It trains them. Um, and, and you meet with party officials around the country. They're, they're often, they are quite educated and quite capable, almost all of them I meet these days. Um, but it's also, at its core, it's still kind of in the caves of Yan'an politically. And it's like, you know, some days you think Tony Soprano is running it because it's, it's families, it's feuds, it's, it's you know, self-interest. And now we've seen that mix come together now with the transition. And Bo Xi Lai, the Chongqing Party secretary who's, and his wife who was involved in a murder and is now in jail, that might have been a very good thing for the party because it kind of blew things up. The question is whether it blew things up enough to fight back at the vested interest that Bob was talking about and allow the party to move things ahead. I mean, in, let's look at the party, you know, how this has gone. Sure, you had, you had it's always been um, a strong man rule. You had the emperors, you had, you had Mao, you had Dong, and then you had Zhu Rongji and Zhang Zeming who were kind of a tag team strong man. Then you get Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao. They come in. And um, they, in fact, are they're nobody special because they're not from um, the elite families. And you've got to remember, the elite families uh, of the Communist Party aristocracy are very, very important in China. So they're not in the elite families. And the structure is now, let's have a collective leadership. Because strong men have taken us in good directions. They've taken us in bad directions. Let's have a collective leadership. And so you get when and who come in in 2001. And I'm not, you know, uh, there's disagreements on this. I give them their due as probably wanting to do a number of reforms, but not having the power to do it. Because they had a nine-member standing committee of powerful people. And then I think just it became every man for himself as who, you know, had to deal with a lot of different party power centers and, and hand off various reins to different people. And you, I think you ended up with every man for himself and not a really collective leadership. And they <laughs> were unable to do a lot of reforms. Then you had the financial crisis. You had all this money, the stimulus money, 600 billion equivalent of US dollars going into state-owned enterprise. And then you know trillions in, in uh, local government financing for this. And so now here, here we are. And really, I, I think you, I haven't heard it, it said this way, but that makes a lot of sense. A lot of experiments that just don't tie together well. Basically, society and the economy have moved ahead of the political system. What is unbelievable about China, I have been there from bicycles to Bentleys, and I have seen so much incredible progress of the middle class. I know a lot of wealthy people. None of them are happy. Nobody's happy. They're not saying, thank you, government. Because why? They're worried about the future, pollution, food safety, health care, corruption, on and on. And they feel like they don't have a grip on things. And they're, 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 some of them are losing hope and, and trying to get out of the country. And the government's paying attention to this. Now, let's go to the new leadership. Xi Jinping is a member of the aristocracy. And he's not, a, not an incapable guy. And he got this job five years ago. And he hasn't been watching DVDs that whole time. I am sure he's been saying, I am going to have the biggest mess on my desk when I take over. And he's had to line up people who will work with him. And I think Bo Xi Lai did him a favor. Because I think it blew things up a bit. And now he's come back. And he's got a seven-man uh, standing committee. The other five, uh, except for he and the Premier Li Keqiang, are term limited out because of age after five years. So they're going to be off the standing committee in five years. So he's got a, he's got a system where he could have a grip. So the, I think the question is here, who's in charge right now? Is it the secret society or is it General Electric? Which part of the party has power 
because that it's going to take the party it's going to take party discipline to get things done. And the thing about China is it's an authoritarian <laughs> government. You get in the way of the party, you will be crushed. But it's a government that runs scared of its own citizens. Anybody under 40 in China only knows exponential growth. And that is their, their base mark. And it's what are you going to, what have you, you know, what are you going to do for me tomorrow? I don't care what you did yesterday. And the government just runs scared of these expectations. And the numbers are, the demographics of China are really very, very frightening because it's going to get rich before it gets old. We got old before we got, we got no, rich it's before, it's going to be old before it gets rich. We got rich before we got old. Europe did, Japan did. Chinese demographics, because of the one child policy, um, has left this huge overhang, and it's getting worse and worse every year of old people and a smaller labor force. Um, the college education, this is a number to pay attention to. Uh, they went, in 10 years, China went from having a total of 6 million people in universities to graduating 6.5 million. They went from a total of 6 to a total of 30 in universities, graduating 2 to graduating 6.5. These are elites. They're, they've gone to college, and they come out now, and they expect a white-collar job, and there are not the white-collar jobs, mm. and their, their earnings are now equal to a migrant worker. Uh, 2,000 RMB a month is the average. So there is, the, the government is running ahead of this, which makes me optimistic, because remember, this is a government that brought you the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, and all kinds of other not very um, good things. And then they turned around and made their country rich. So the party in the past has been able to pivot and move. It just depends on whether the corruption and self-interest has gripped it so much that it can't do what it did in the past. And that's an open question right now. Right. So all of you, to some degree, have outlined this huge laundry list of, of big issues that are facing China going ahead, which um, you know, many of you posit the idea that, yes, this is going to, that, that they will have to change to some degree because the situation cannot hold. Now, then, of course, the big question here, which everybody would love to know and nobody really does, is what's the leadership going to do? Because you know, guessing what the leadership does in China is a bit of a reading the tea leaf situation. Now, I'm pretty sure that guessing what it will do will take us more than an hour. It could take us years and years. But for the purposes of this panel, well, given the fact that you guys have all laid the table and said, look, China's uh, situation um, is problematic going ahead, and you've all listed many reasons ranging from environment to demographics to business, what, you know, I'm going to ask you guys to each put on a sort of a guessing hat and say, what do you think, name one or two measures that you think you will see some real reform in. I'm going to ask you guys to reach on a limb here, you know, because, uh, and say, you know, everything range. What are you going to think you're going to see that will change and what, you know, that could say about the le leadership's um, commitment to reform? Um, do you want to start, Adam? Yeah, but if I could, I mean, I would back up a second. I mean, I think you're, it's not that, you're right, it's not that useful to play this parlor game. Mm -hmm. You know, will they, won't they? We'll find out whether they will or they won't. But it is possible to step back and say, what are the conditions that have enabled reform in the past? Exactly. You mentioned Jurongji, so what made it possible to do that in the 90s? And do those conditions exist again today in some configuration? And then secondly, what are the signposts, which is what you're Yeah, saying. Let's, so, let's look for the signposts. Now, what do you think are some of the A and B points that if they do this, I mean, there are lots of things that are crying out for change, as we agree. What do you think some of those issues that you, you will start to possibly see some real change? Are we talking environment? Are we talking pensions? Are we talking taxation? You've outlined some of this in your foreign policy article. Do you want to pick one or two? Well, I think the things I would watch are, one, devolution of power away from the central government toward local governments and provincial governments. You talked about muni finance. I mean, China has, you, you said something interesting, Perry. You said, you know, it's irrational that they seize land. It's actually not irrational no. because incentives Incentives drive a lot of behaviors, and the incentives are structured in such a way That's right. that, exactly. I mean, you know, who could do a general obligation bond in China because there's no transparency about tax, you know, tax system, budget transparency. So you, you don't have the basis for a muni market. You've got a property tax that's been piloted in two places, Shanghai and Chongqing. You don't have a national property tax, really. Um, so local governments seize land, sell land, or they use these shadowy local finance vehicles. So I think the first area I'd watch is devolution uh, of a lot of authorities, uh, certain authorities, away from the center uh, to empower local government in new ways, especially in terms of fiscal authority, project approval authority away from the planning commission at the center, uh, down to local governments, uh, doing something about administrative red tape. So that's one. Mm -hmm. um, a second I'd watch is how certain resources and subsidies are priced. 
let's take energy pricing. Mm -hmm. uh, cheap access to energy has been really central uh, in a lot of ways to the whole subsidy regime. Uh, it's something that state-owned enterprises in particular benefit from. Um, and so uh, market-based pricing for energy I think is worth keeping an eye on, and Bob, you may want to weigh in on this too. Yeah. But China, with all these energy problems, has had a lot more success spurring supplies than doing something on the demand side. And they've played around with resource taxes and other things, but getting the prices right, um, I think, is going to be critical. I'd watch financial reform um, closely. Well, that's a big one. What do you, it's a you big get a one. More specific. Well, I think um, I think there's a whole mess of reforms that will enable the private sector. Uh, to get access to capital in a way that's much more rational than, than what you have now. Mm. Um, and I work with Hank Paulson in Chicago, and Hank has this line that he likes to use, that China's a nation of savers. It needs to be a nation of investors, not just consumers, but a nation of investors. That you have this precautionary <laughs> savings problem, uh, first because of pensions and social welfare, but also because you don't have the variety of options in terms of what people can do with their money. So financial reforms, that allocate capital in a more rational way, you know, corporate bonds, other things. I think that's worth watching. And then I think the pension and social security reforms, which have been, uh, you know, in the healthcare sector, for instance, they're partial. And China is filled with vast unfunded mandates yeah. that impose huge policy burdens on local governments. Mm -hmm. And as we said when we talked about muni finance, right. that local governments don't have the capacity or yeah. the instruments to finance. Um, uh, but where the central government only assumes part of the burden and then imposes these mandates. So those are the ones I'm watching. But then I think they're the harder reforms, you know, things like forcing dividends out of SOEs. That's a hard reform. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, I, and I, would, I would agree with you with decentralization and decision making and also reform the tax code in China. So th th today, in case the audience don't know, the Local government funding, provincial government funding, all the budget comes from central government. So whatever short of, if they, the local plan to expand more, they need to tap on the land. I think that's well, the Except the business tax. They get part of the business Right. They, uh, yeah, so. a little, but, but not enough because they are measured by, by, by how fast your economy is growing. So like yeah, it's incentives. Right, so incentive. Wrong so incentive. So if you give the comparison, it would be like yeah. in the States, but, but then you remember, Zhu Rongji was the one who in the 90s reverse it and say, you have to pay me your local, ta your provincial tax to us in order to control the provincial and city government. So now uh, after the experiment, this is uh, going back to the experiment again. So they thought, you know, we need to give the local some flexibility. So that actually would be, would be, would be very interesting. I think this, I agree with you. You mean that to reverse the 90s exactly. tax reform? Or very brave by doing that, very brave. Because uh, now, if you look back in the past 10 years, province actually have, have more power, more say. And often they would, they would say, yes, we will listen to the agenda of the national government, but they do what they do, uh, be, you know, for best for their province. So that, I don't know how that would even out in, in terms of how that would play out uh, in, 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 in political uh, and administrative development. I, I like the idea that you, you have on the state SOE dividends. I think the unfunded agenda would be great mm -hmm. uh, to, to fund the cover. You know. one, one thing I really like the, the, the point that you address is that to make every citizen, I think one of the big gaps in the past in China is that we have a lot of rich people and, and a lot of labor gone from countryside to the city and foregoing families and so on and so forth. They didn't get the dividends. So now the government tried to reverse it by saying uh, they ha actually have begun in, in, in pension and healthcare reform. So now literally 80% of the population in China, in China already covered by, by that. So I totally Which agree. Which is with vastly underfunded But, but to, right to now. go further down the road, that will be very challenging. Can I? Okay. Bob, yeah, let me, let me just and add a few. I think uh, my agenda the, the, has been already discussed to a degree. I think let me just quickly identify. One is I think there will be almost has to be some kind of municipal bond financing because this notion of alienating large numbers of peasants by taking their land, raising revenues for the municipality, and giving it away at a very cheap price with subsidized energy to someone who wants to build a factory uh, or some big real estate development is socially disruptive and a distortion of resources. 
and, uh, and Lo Jiwei, the new finance minister, who used to be, by the way, head of China Development Corporation, smart guy, very market-oriented, he said, more money in through the front door, less money through the back door. That's his That's a good motto. Quote. So this is basically what, what they're, they're thinking. The second, I think, pollution. They have to deal with that. It is a social issue of the first order, and I think they will be very robust in, in dealing with this. How do you and, think they're going to deal with Well, it? energy subsidies, as has been mentioned, is, is one part of the equation. What's very interesting in the last conversations I had, which was three, were three weeks ago, there was actually talk about a carbon tax. Now, how far this is going to go, I don't know, but these were people from very senior ministries. Wouldn't it be an irony if the country we, we criticize the most for being polluting it, it, uh, adopts a carbon tax before the United States, um, which has been the country that had talked about it sort of early on, but is not likely to do it. China may decide they want to do it. I'm not sure they will, but at least senior people are, are talking about it. Um, the third relates to the broader issue of energy. They have huge energy requirements, and, they, and their demand for energy, imported energy, is enormous. They're building pipes from Kazakhstan. They're trying to get more from Russia. When, when Xi Jinping went to see Putin, they talked about this. Didn't really reach any major deals, but they will over a period of time. They have to worry more and more because more of their energy is going to come from the Gulf, gas and oil. Less comes here, more goes to China. They have the whole question of supply chains, maritime security, freedom of navigation. Huge challenges uh, for them. Then um, an another one is the issue that we haven't talked much about, but it's a big issue for Americans. That's intellectual property protection. This is a big issue. It's not so much that we keep telling them they have to do this. But they want to have, they have something called a going out strategy. They want more of their companies to be accepted around the world so that they can invest in other parts of the world. They want to sell sophisticated uh, telecommunications and other equipment. They want high-end investment in China because wages are going up in eastern China. So they have to have higher-end, higher-paying investment. If they continue their uh, terrible practices in some provinces at least, many parts of the country, about protecting or lack of protection of intellectual property, it's very hard to see them accomplishing all these things, particularly cyber piracy, but other kinds of intellectual property. So their own people and their own interests are going to press them to improve. They won't be perfect, but I, but I do think that they will Im improve considerably. And the last goes back to their relations with the United States. I think the relations with the United States are going to be, as they have been for a long time, characterized by differences in some areas and cooperation in others. I do think in the area of environment, in the area of energy, particularly shale, but other cleaner types of energy, there'll be a, a lot more collaboration between the United States and China and on things like keeping the food chain uh, free of contaminants or pollutants, things of that nature. They're, they talk about having a new kind of relationship with the United States, much more engaged, we're interested in doing the same thing, and I think these are categories of issues where that's possible. It's interesting you mentioned an issue of cyber piracy here. I, th I was just hearing on the radio as I was driving over this morning that the U.S. Um, Trade Department just released a report uh, uh, pinpointing China for the issue of uh, intellectual property rights, and particularly with relations to um, cyber, cyber spying, uh, cyber hacking. And that seems to be a particular area in which U.S.-China uh, relations might not be so smooth or harmonious. Yeah, that, it's true. And I think there are, there are many areas where I think our relations are improving, and I would say quite considerably. And I think I've spent some time with Xi Jinping when he was uh, provincial secretary earlier on when I was in, in my private sector job. I think he wants to get more investment. I think there are a lot of areas where we can really work together and relations are improving. The whole question of, of cyber is not one of those areas. It's, in fact, an area where things are, are getting considerably worse. And I, and I do think this is a problem. And why is it a problem? It's a problem in part because I really don't think it serves China's long-term interests for the reasons I mentioned about getting high-end investment and being able to have your products accepted around the world if people are fearful that built into those is technology that was stolen from an American company or that they built in some kind of cyber trap door that people are worried about. So this cyber issue is a very big issue, but it also causes a great deal of distrust on the part of American businesses who China is going to need 
to help it deal with some of these issues and on the part of the U.S. government where there are a lot of people, myself included, going back to the early 70s when I went over with Kissinger, I've always been a believer that the relationship between the United States and China is really going to be the defining relationship of the 21st century. If there's all this uh, mistrust over cyber and how it can be used for stealing trade secrets and, 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 dealing, and tr stealing other kinds of secrets, uh, this, this can be a big setback. And China wants, actually, a constructive relationship with the United States. They're not ready to challenge the United States broadly in some parts of the area, uh, the region they are, but not, not the broad American system. They need American technology in many parts of China, and it's going to be very hard to get or to invest here in this going out strategy if they can't satisfy us that they are, and, and the world, that they're not engaging in cyber, cyber piracy or other types of, of, uh, of cyber interventions that are harmful to our interests. Well, I'd just like to interject a quick note of realism here that, um, you know, while at this point in time China appears to be the bad guy on, on a, at least in the media, uh, with regards to intellectual property theft and cyber hacking, we should think a little bit back of the history of the United States and the Industrial Revolution too, and to realize we're not entirely blameless too. But we're, we're not, and other countries are. And blameless other too. countries too, you know. So, but I'm not holding us blameless. I'm simply saying, in the current moment, the big challenges from can we have yeah, but, can yeah. we have slide 16, please? Mm -hmm. That actually support Bob's point. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I don't what was the side? Six, well, actually, I was going to say Jim had some uh, um, quest, um, points he wanted to bring up on um, cyber. Jim's cyber. done a lot of work on this. So. Yeah. You, you have something to say? No, no, I just I thought this is a wonderful Well, we're waiting for this. Um, yeah. Um, cyber hacking is a huge, huge problem. It's leading to a lot of distrust. There's, I have an article in the, the Atlantic site this weekend on it that if you go to it, you'll see the links to all the U.S. government and security company reports on the extent of the problem. My big worry there is it's leading to distrust in, by American companies of their Chinese employees on whether you're going to hire Chinese employees as engineers and scientists. Another kind of Wen Ho Lee situation? Yeah, like we had with the, uh, when Gingrich stirred it up with uh, the nuclear scientist Wen Ho Lee uh, back during the Clinton administration, and it turned out to be a, a, a lot of smoke and very little fire. So that's very worrisome. And um, whether, you know, how how easy is it going to be for, for the party leaders to get a grip on this? Because this is coming out of military and the security people who are not, uh, they are very powerful people in China. You asked about reforms. Mm -hmm. um, devolving power to the, from the center and also tax revenue is good, but you, how do you, they also have to build systems of accountability. Of course. That's the problem. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, why did Zhu Rongji take it back? Because it was so damn corrupt out there. He wanted to get a grip on things and, and have it coming out of the center. Well, we've had that time. Now you need to get it out there, but you're going to have to have some accountability. Uh, a reform to look at, a couple, one is a real estate tax. Real estate in China is not like our bubble in that it's not all leveraged. It's hard to be rich in China. You got a few hundred million dollars. What are you going to do with it? You can only buy so many villas and golf course memberships and leak what you can offshore. There's not, you, know, you don't have a hedge fund and mutual funds and all these things to put your money in, so you buy real estate. <laughs> or if you're just modestly wealthy, you buy three or four apartments. So there's no penalty for holding those apartments because there's no annual real estate tax. They need to clear that inventory because it's just, buildings are empty but they're owned. And they need to clear that, but that's going to be hard because a lot of the officials who would have to say, yeah, let's do that real estate tax, probably have three or four or five apartments themselves. But for local governments, they're going to need this real estate tax to, to fund themselves because the land grab strategy is not going to work anymore politically and they don't really have, they've kind of gotten rid of a lot of the land they, they could use to do that. Another one is real urban reform for housing registration called a HUCO. Mm. You've got... In Beijing, you've got 20 million people, 12 million have legal registration, 8 million do not have legal registration. They're there working, but they don't have access to education, health care, and all the social benefits, because when you're born in China, your housing registration stays where you are unless you can transfer it, which is a laborious and well con very controlled process. Your average, your average city in China, larger cities have 25%. So these are almost like the, uh, they're almost like the undocumented workers in America in some way. So they've got to make them legal. The great social justice story of China that we're approaching is 
China has to make those people consumers or it won't keep growing. You're going to turn China into a consumer economy, they're the new consumers. Because the 300 million people who are the consumers in China are urban residents who grew up in urban areas and they've consumed and they're doing pretty well. You have to take this group of people and make them, and make them urban residents. You've got 13 to 15 million people moving into the cities every year. The World Bank report that was done beginning of last year, uh, and Li Keqiang, the premier, was quite involved in that. It's World Bank and the Research Center of the State Council did it together. They say that if you can take 10 million of these migrant workers a year and make them legal citizens and consumers, you can drive 6% growth in China for 20 years or more. So that is a really, and Li Keqiang is going to be all about urbanization. And on pollution, once China snaps and decides this is a business opportunity, look out. Mm. It used to be, well, we can't close down this inefficient factory. They're going to say, let's close all these factories and let's put up 10 factories that make these solar panels or these wind or whatever and coal gasification or whatever. And you're going to see, you're going to see China move pretty quick once that happens. Well, if I may sum this up and I want to leave some time for questions. So, some of the things you guys have all outlined, uh, decentralization uh, and um, pollution re reform issues per pertaining to pollution, um, taxation, and um, also to some degree social issues, urbanization, um, the hukou system. Actually, I, I may want to add, I think, I think Evan touched on it and, and Jim, you touched on it. The way I look at China, the next big opportunity, I don't know because I probably didn't really cover the whole document from last year, the, 30, the 2030 China report. I thought one of the biggest opportunity for China is two areas, uh, urban urbanization and financial sector reform. And now, it's not new. If you look at each bucket, been doing for 30 years, been doing for at least uh, you know, half a decade. I think what makes, I think from my perspective, make it very promising is that uh, can I have slide 19? Instead of loading up China's tier one tier city with labor from the countryside, the, ch the, the government's new idea is a building industry close to labor source. So in, in a tertiary city or maybe even smaller, to build industry to drive local economic growth. Now, if you look back the urbanization model, the old urbanization model in China, it was driven by central government investments, right? The state council lended out billions and trillions of dollars. They built uh, uh, the Shanghai Delta. They built Tianjin, uh, uh, Xinxi. All those are large scale. And the last one, by the way, that was attempted was Chongqing, which didn't go well. From now on, I think, if we can be, or even the Chinese brave government is, is brave enough, they tie in the urbanization with industry-based development, not just by building people, say you move there because the city is better and you can spend more money as urban citizens. Rather, tie industry building there where labor is still cheap, <coughs> land still abundant. But what the Chinese government need to do, this is where the financial sector comes in, that if they open up the financial markets and say, rather than the central government front-loading, back-loading, or loading investment, they ask private sector to help. So you open up the market, debt market, equity market, but primary debt market to say, this is the development opportunity, and the government front load some of them, seeded the money, and the local government, if the market can be structured in an open, transparent way. I think people would go in there to invest in those those tertiary cities. Actually, a lot of Hong Kong property developers, by the way, in the past five, 10 years, have been avoiding large city. They have been building in a tertiary city because they saw that, they smell that. Now, what, it needs, the, the, what makes financial market reform is critical and important in China is that the Chinese government is running out of money, believe it or not. They cannot do the same scale of urbanization that they did in the past 30 years. So that makes the Chinese capital market one of the most interesting play in the next decades or so. And also I would like to add, well, the condition is there, are the leadership brave enough to do it? Uh, if you look at the past 10 years or 10, 15 years, there are uh, the vested interests that are sitting on energy and finance have been very stable, unchanged, pretty much kept in the same interest group. 
Now, the new leadership actually has some distance with those old vested interests. So to him, or to them, that's something I think that they can venture and say, what can we do to trade, to move this sector open up further? Now, that to me is the promising side of China, that looking at a new experiment, a new lab, by combining China's development with private equity markets or debt market or new instruments. Now, that's difficult. That's not going to be easy. Maybe I'm dreaming up. But that would be something effective. Well, look, China built these stock markets. I remember the first story I did for the Wall Street Journal in 1990 was about a guy named Million Xiong standing in the middle of the street in Shanghai, and he controlled the four stocks on the illegal stock market. And everybody was, you know, around him. And so what, how many years later were there 60,000 accounts being opened every week? I mean, Chinese people being given the opportunity to do financial markets, it, they're pretty good at it. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, and, there, and, there, and there's a lot of creativity. There are little pockets where they're very, they have the dim sum bongs now and the panda bonds. They're really experimenting with a whole range of new financial techniques for making the RMB a little bit more convertible. There are a lot of, for trying to get more foreign investment in, even enabling Chinese to invest out of China. They're, they're very fertile, and I think you've got a finance minister who's the, guy, the kind of guy who yeah. is going to try to be innovative in the financial they're sector because he at, knows this sector very, very well. But they're good at experimentation, right? They yeah. pilot everything. But well, Jim, see, made, I, yeah. Jim made a really important point, I think, when we talked about the decentralization. It's really federalism, not decentralization, right? Yes, they need to open up bond markets, local bond markets, but to do that, they'll need to get the, inst the underlying institutions right because who will invest in a municipal yeah. debt issue That's true. without tax transparency? Well, here I wanted to put it a good so word. they need to get the institutions yeah, right. Yeah, uh, yeah, experimentation was sort of looked on as in a somewhat n negative way and <laughs> by someone dependent. I would put it a good word for experimentation. Um, the United States was an experiment. The Constitution was an experiment. When Roosevelt took over, during the uh, Depression, he said, what do Americans need? Bold, persistent experimentation. I'm all for the Chinese experimenting, and what they're doing is very clever. In many cases, they experiment, and this is Deng's genius. He experimented province by province, or regional area by regional area, and I think this is what's gonna happen with China. They're not going to be called federalism or decentralization. When they experiment, it won't be all of China, all at once, all the time, it'll be different experiments in different provinces, different cities, seeing what works or what doesn't work, and then they will modify those and maybe bring them to scale. So I think there will be more uh, experimentation, but it won't be all of China. It will be done as Dung did in parts of China, see what works. And if it works, great. If not, they'll try something else. Let a thousand little Shenzhen's bloom. That's we? right, a thousand flowers. And a fl thousand flowers are blooming all over China, not just in Beijing, and I do think the second and third tier cities is an area where you're going to see a lot of this experimentation take place. Flowers wouldn't last in Beijing with the pollution, but anyway, I'm going to just open this out right now to uh, questions from the audience. Yes, I see a gentleman coming out to the mic there. Hello. Could um, you identify yourself first? And hi, my, uh, my name is Michael with the U.S. Senate. Um, I just had one, uh, one question. Do any of you uh, in your lifetime think that we will see any one of the three in China? Uh, a jasmine revolution of some sort, multi-party elections, or actual referendums on issues? And your answer could be yes in an experimentation on B and C. Nope. Nope. <laughs> that was quick, come on. <laughs> That's the pessimistic part. <laughs> Well, the Jasmine Revolution question is certainly something that the government is very concerned with, and that's why the clamp down on, on social media. Um, so, are you really? I don't. Well, I just. I just think the party is. You know, the party. If the party doesn't reform, you will. It, you will have violence that will lead to change. But I would guess that violence would be more like Tiananmen, where it's. It happens. It shakes things up. Some heads roll and then the new leadership moves it forward. Because Chinese people, they know what can happen in their country when there's nobody running things. And, and the party is everything. So I would not, even if it gets that bad, I don't see the whole place blowing up in a jasmine revolution. But I could see violence uh, coming that would lead to change. 
if, if, they, if the party doesn't change from the top. There's only two ways to change in China. They either change from the top or it blows up on the bottom. Mm. Yeah, you know, you got, what, 100,000 plus social protests a year. Yeah. And this is the dilemma of people. Some people say, oh, well, if they don't reform, they'll, you, you know, you got to remove the underlying causes of the protest. So they got to reform faster. And then you got other people who say, oh, yeah, but if you reform too fast, then you'll have protests everywhere. I think, you know, in the meantime, Chinese politics is not, in fact, an oxymoron. There are, you know, yeah. you look at Jim's presentation, the very first thing you said, it's all about politics. And there's, it's a one-party system, but there's a lot of policy pluralism, at least. You pick your yeah. issue. That's right. You know, right, we reform the interest rate, you know, cut the yeah. state on enterprises loose, uh, sanction Iran. There are interest groups that divide around all of these, and where you sit is where you stand. And you China. may get greater or lesser degrees of participation in decision-making in certain parts of China than in others, but no, Jasmine, not, the answer to all three is I don't think it's likely in, our, in my lifetime anyway. Brendan, you have a question? Do you want to head up to the mic there, please? Um, I was just hoping you could comment on the relationship of the premier of, uh, to the military, you know, who versus she, um, and just if that's transformed at all. Yeah. We, the, the relationship of, I'm sorry. The, the premier? With the premier? The premier? Yeah. Oh, you mean the president? Oh, you, you mean, mean the, the president? Uh, Hu Jintao the versus Xi Jinping yeah. connections in military. Yeah. Well, yeah, the part comes from uh, his father was uh, was one of the immortals, one of the uh, you know, one of the leaders of the revolution. Tough guy, had his ups and downs, but his first job out of college was working for the defense minister. Right. Secretary yeah. of to the defense minister. Yeah. And so it, he's also part of the princeling. So I think he's got, I think he's got a better. Uh, probably a better channel to them and he got the central military commission job right away but also he's a, he's he's a coming across now as a much more muscular nationalist mm -hmm. on we you know and he's telling the military you got to be ready to fight a war and so that's rattling some people but i think what he's trying to do is you got to quit driving brent bentley's and being corrupt and you got to actually build a better military machine yeah and there are two things to remember one the the military does not report to the government in china reports to the party it's an interesting thing to she's report. Oh, his Se father was I'm sorry, go ahead. No, and then and then the second and yeah, and the second is if you listen to what they're saying about their military plans, the biggest emphasis is on the Navy. Um, they clearly and they mention it in terms of their protection of their maritime interests. In virtually every speech, it's the focus on the Navy. That's what you have to watch if you're looking at additional Bob support. when you talk to him are, they, are you hearing you know we talk about um, you know maritime freedom and, and you know because they're like us they've got assets all over the world yeah. they need open sea lanes but the mentality has been let's hold our coast and push people back to the third island chain when you talk to officials or the nine not, dotted line thing that they've yeah done. so are they are people are, are you getting that the whole let's have open lanes and protect them this is a debate, this is a discussion that we're going to have to have. We haven't really gotten that far in the, in the but, but their interests are to keep maritime lanes open and free so that they can get energy from the Middle East, gas and oil in particular from the Middle East. So I think there's an opportunity for a dialogue with them, but we're, we haven't gotten to that point yet. It, it, they, need, they need that, they need those sea lanes, particularly Straits of Malacca, Straits of Hormuz. Who keeps them open now? Straits of Hormuz. Not, there's not a Chinese fleet there, there's an American fleet there. The same, and I don't think most people in that region, certainly not India or other countries, would feel comfortable with a blue water Chinese Navy going, going that far. On the other hand, they do work with us on the anti-piracy effort. There's Chinese ships that do help us, and, and others, it's un, normally under a British admiral, even Iranian ships by and large, are, a, are, are working to deal with the pirates, but they don't have a big blue water Navy in the Indian Ocean. Bob, I'm, we're going to finish up the session here, but I actually have one last question, and I'm so, unfortunately we're out of time, but given that we've talked about population as an issue, aging population, um, you know, diminished workforce, um, and, and um, you know, demographics as a big issue, one of the, maybe an elephant in the room would be the one-child policy. Do you think that's going to end soon? 
I mean, that's one policy change that I think, you know, seems to be something that people there's have discussed. Of, there's certainly a lot of talk about it. There's a lot of talk. It's there's unevenly talk administered, it. don't forget. In parts of China, they strictly administer it. In other parts, like rural China, they don't. Well, this, in fact, we've just seen a restructuring that's very important. That's right. They've taken the family, State Family Planning Commission. Demographers for 15 years have been saying, we've got to stop this. It's not in our interest. But the Family Planning Commission is a very powerful bureaucracy. So in this last go-round of government reform, it, they have just taken the Family Planning Commission and split it in pieces. The, the, the health part is going into the Ministry of Health. The demography part and planning is going into NDRC. This is the beginning of winding this down. So I, you I say it's going to wind down? It's, it's winding down unofficially, and I think it's going to wind down officially because the demographics are very frightening for yeah. the government. But, but then to me, is, is, it, is it too late? So if you look at the urban dwellers, how many children can they afford to have? That actually is a more practical question. Yeah, some um, actually some academics have actually called the one-child policy one of the big policy errors that the Chinese government has taken. I don't know. I mean, what would you think? What's your opinion? It was an experiment. I think they're changing the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On that note, our session. So, um, what about the export? Uh, I'm sorry. Export currency. Export. China's currency. Oh, you mean using the renminbi for trade settlement? Kind of like the euro dollar. Oh, trading for they're trading for trade settlement settlements. rather than they're not it's opening not the capital account; they're using it for trade. It's just bilateral yeah. equilibrating. It's it's a step on the road to uh, the renminbi yeah. over to, but they'll need to open the capital account yeah, eventually it's, it's to make it really a reserve. Yeah, yeah but they're doing these it facilitates settlement agreements. Settlements. Well, I'm sorry, we need to they're vacate for the other session, but thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.